Okay, so yeah, this um, this is a sequel to last year's talk. Um, uh, so to give some historical context, uh, this is the text from my final slide last year. Uh, where do I go next with my with my hobby of writing uh, uh, fourth interpreters that will never be used for anything? I was like, what if, what if we could generate them programmatically? Um, guess what I've been doing this year? Um, <laughs> I said at the end, prophetically, ask me how this is going next year. This is how it's going. <laughs> um, so, uh, I thought, oh, I wish we could have a force generator. So I started uh, started on um, on 4G, uh, and paper about test bootstrapping the tank, which got me going very quickly. And I um, um, just a code sample, but um, direct and indirect coding interpreters that would both um, test the, uh, the core uh, test suite from uh, the Hayes and Jackson. Um, well, initially the Hayes and then uh, switch to the, the Jackson, I think is the larger of the two, isn't it? Um, and, um, and yeah, this was, this was fun as far as it went, but I quickly realized that this, this was not in any way a scalable approach, that if I wanted to change the register allocation, I needed to write a new, um, uh, write, a, write a new runtime system. Um, the, the, the thing I optimistically call common.s uh, is only common as long as you're, you're using the same, same register allocations between the direct threaded and the indirect threaded. Um, yeah, so um, um, uh, 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 behind hash defines effectively, um, behind macro, uh, macro values. Uh, and this did not get me very far at all. Um, the, the code changes completely. Again, if you have a top of stack register, for example, um, you run in, you rapidly run into situations where the x86 instruction set, because all of this so far has been in x 32 bit x86, um, because, uh, because I, I like that retro vibe. Um, and um, uh, yeah, you rapidly run into situations where you're having to mix these like red red with ETF, ETF because you have um, dependencies inside the x86 instruction set. Um, so for example, We'll, we'll see the uh, the div instructions later on, the division instructions, which have essentially four implicit parameters, um, in, implicit registers that they require. Uh, so yeah, macros was a dead end. It, it, the complexity explodes rapidly as soon as you want to do. I needed I needed a better abstraction. And this this is where sign language came into the picture. Of course abstraction is sign language. But what I noticed was that what I noticed was that the stack comments in the source are eminently compilable. 
Um, they they encode the they clearly encode the behaviour of except some of the more exotic stuff like the double coated. confusing um, because um, uh, well yes yeah, this idiom of comment enforced is now actually part of the language the colon actually generates a code definition as you can see from the second box on the screen at the moment um, and a code definition generates a machine code procedure and uh, a uh, machine code procedure um, that you would call with the call in six on x thirty six, for example. Um, so it's one step closer to the hardware than than fourth is. Um, but certainly for things like stack manipulation prim uh, primitives, it's pretty clear what that definition of get, uh, of dupe uh, does. Um, uh, and so, if your stack pointer is somewhere exotic. Um, yeah, it's it's easy to generate. All you know need to know uh, to handle this is how to do a push and a pop through an arbitrary register. And so this is this is what the general case looks like. Um, the pop is a move from memory and then a register increment, and push is a register decrement followed by a move to memory. Um, and of course, on 32 bit x 86 you can do that through any register, uh, any general purpose, reg any of the eight general purpose registers that you that you have. Um, sixteen bit. I, I'm looking forward to the challenge of porting this to sixteen bit. Um, I, I think I may run into some assumptions I've made about um, about how general purpose some of the registers are, but that's a problem for another day. Um, oh yeah. As you can see, you could go through and you could remove. Quite a few of those, quite a few redundant uh, instructions from that uh, from that definition, but readability is the important factor here because what I'm doing here is automating the boring parts of my heading, which is generating the basic runtime system, which involves a lot of repetitive work that I've done hundred times because of particular me. Um, so, so the, the primary motivator behind this is to produce readable code, not Efficient code that I can then, if I want to, I can go through and uh, hand optimize later. Um, uh, so, what about the return stack? Well, oh, yes, the new assembler. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. So, it's ATT syntax, not uh, Intel syntax. Uh, yeah, so the, the destination is at the end. Sorry. I know, that, I know a lot of people in the hate to know assembler. I use it because it's ubiquitous. You can pull up any system that has GCC on it, which is basically any system, and you've got it. Um, no external dependencies on things like that. I understand the shortcomings of the assembler, but I like it for its ubiqu uh, ubiquity. And, um, and actually, it's not as bad as simple code. Uh, it is, it's a pretty competent macro assembly, but it has some syntax and reality to do with it, which is a very strong for order, but, um, uh, but it, it, didn't really, it wouldn't really need to have it. Uh, um, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm kind of used to this now, so uh, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that at the outset. But, um, but yeah, we're using the new assembler syntax here. Um, one, of my, one of my goals actually, it's on the kind of final slide about 
the next last sli slide about what um, where I want to go with this is I want to actually allow you to generate mapping uh, or mapping uh, or even C code if you want. I want to put different backends on this. So the new assembler is just the, the assembler I'm most familiar with. So that was what I started using uh, out of the door. Uh, so that's um, uh, we have a new, uh, a new word uh, open bracket r colon, which tells the uh, the fail interpreter that okay, I'm 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 now putting and checking to the return stack rather than to the data stack, and um, and you get told something like that, and so you think it's got to for example, the right and um, nothing to stop using uh, both stacks at once. Uh, it will um, it will generate sensibility and uh, uh, it, it will do things in the right order. Um, uh, and this is a quite emergent property that actually turned out to be a trivial definition that it didn't it, it's it's quite a non it's quite a non standard both of them. Uh, in terms of what it does. Um, and then um, uh, the, the, the implementation is for the old uh, IP here is a fourth reg is the name of a fourth register rather than an arbitrary virtual register. And um, the file interpreter knows in its configuration which machine register IP is in uh, and so generates the correct code for exit. Uh, so what about words that actually do something? Okay. That stuff like isn't drawing complete. Probably. I mean, I, I think there's a potential for my talk next year in that stuff. <laughs> it's going which is a topic of my to put that in, which I really want to talk about. Um, Uh, 
TGC, which I mentioned before, um, does this by allowing you to produce uh, helper functions in C, basically. Um, and so that, that would also be an approach where I could just, instead of using the div instruction, I could just call out into the C environment and do my division in C uh, in a C function uh, using a foreign function interface. But obviously that has overhead for context switching between fourth and C. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's that's kind of a broad overview of where I am. Um, the um, there's a lot of stuff that I'd still like to do with this. So um, currently, there's still you still need to provide a couple of dozen lines of assembly, a couple of macros uh, in order for the run to bootstrap the runtime. Um, I would like to move that, I'd like to abstract that out and move that into fail as well. Um, so that you, you can take, you can theoretically with a, with an appropriate code generator, take your fail code and move it to an ARM machine, move it from an x86 to an ARM machine and just compile it and have a working force compiler, which you can be reasonably sure modulo any bugs in my implementation of fail uh, will have the same behavior as the fourth implementation that you had on x86. Also modulo differences in hardware. But, um, um, currently we have, uh, um, yeah, it's currently written in ORC. Uh, ORC is a much better language for text processing, for like Trans transpiling text files to text files than force is. Uh, but I would really like this to be uh, implemented in, um, in ANSI force so that you can take an ANSI force system you already have, turn it into fail, compile your 
new anti fault system with different um, execution semantics. Uh, how's my time doing? Okay, about half an hour. Um, uh, so, yeah, would, um, there's a couple of situations where it would have been nice to be able to use fail words inside fail words. So, next, I showed you how to implement next in fail. Uh, currently, it's if for pragmatic reasons, it's implemented as an assembly macro. Um, and that's to do with the fact that fail doesn't, it, it, fail isn't forced. Fail cannot see its own dictionary. Uh, there's a special case of that for constants. So you can define constants and fail keeps a record. Oh, I'm, I've got a list of constants here. Um, so I can reuse them later in the code. But um, yeah, it, it's not, that's not a general purpose system at the moment. Um, and I'm not, because currently you can, the, all of the examples I've given have, the virtual registers have had single letter names. That's not a requirement. You can use C, C Adra 1, C Adra 2 as your, as your kind of virtual fa uh, registers in your stack comments. Um, so, um, if I, yeah, I like that property of it, and I think I might have to sacrifice that and have a naming scheme for the virtual registers if I allow calls to arbitrary um, arbitrary functions that have already been defined. I don't know yet. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'd like to select a back end for machine code. Um, uh, ah, and currently, the, the dictionary implementation is hard coded. So um, that's, uh, that's something else that you have to provide so, uh, macros for in the assembly. Uh, all that this system does is generate uh, calls to uh, word or code macros, which, um, which then produce the headers for you. And yeah, for, I, I went down a very deep rabbit hole with the fail language. Because what I, my, my vision originally was for a single command line utility where you could say, okay, give me a token threaded for, for ARM with the top two values on the stack permanently in registers and implementing the F83 standard. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm still a long way from that. That, like the, um, that. that was the ultimate goal here, that you could get an assembly listing, which would give you an arbitrary fault system, um, which actually relating to the question you were asking about what's the, what's the penalty for using the hardware in ways that the hardware designers weren't expecting, uh, re relating to Anton's talk earlier. Um, this could actually give you useful information about that. So for example, if you have a, um, uh, if you've got an example which is using you know, call and, a subroutine threaded forth using call and return, for example, uh, and compare that to uh, compare the performance of that to an otherwise identical forth where all the other register allocations are the same, but you're using um, uh, using an indirect threaded uh, indirect threaded or direct threaded model. Uh, and you could see, okay, like how much of a how much of a branch prediction penalty does that actually give me? That would be that would be the kind of benchmarking you could potentially do with a with a complete 4G. Um, but um, don't know how long that's going to take. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I think I'd also like some I'd like some more complete ANSI support. So my my only guarantee about ANSI support at the moment is passes the test suite. Uh, I think the core and core ext parts of the test suite, um, and um, because I'm generating a lot of machine code here, I wanted to be sure that everything I had was was the same as the thing that I started with. So my use case for ANSI 4 has been just testing that, but I know I'm breaking the ANSI standard in multiple places. For example, um, my current 
input processing is reading line by line, not character by character, which I believe is is something that's clearly specified in the in the standard. But that, that do, that's not required for passing the test uh, test suite, so that was a low priority for me. Um, yeah. So that, <laughs> have I have I considered any artificial intelligence assistance? No, no. This is my hobby. I'm not. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't want ChatGPT to do my hobby for me. That would take all of the fun out of it. <laughs> okay. So why why am I using a 32-bit x86 rather than a 64-bit, which would give me twice as many registers to play with? And it's for exactly that reason. It gives me twice as many registers to play with. Uh, if I can make if I can make it work on a, on 32-bit x86, then porting it to 64-bit is trivial. Um, I, think I I commented earlier on in the talk that taking this to 16-bit might actually be be quite challenging, because I'm assuming things about how the x86 registers are used. So I'm you know I'm assuming you can freely use EAX to, as a pointer into memory, and of course AX in 16-bit uh, x86 you you cannot do that. Um, you, you have to use, what is it, um, SI, CI, and uh, BX, or BP, for the memory of SP. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, I chose 32-bit precisely because it was such a restrictive environment. Um, so, essentially, the, the, the question is, why, why am I using... Uh, um, an old-fashioned uh, threaded fourth system rather than subroutine threading, rather than na native code. Uh, <laughs> old-fashioned was my, was my words, not Stephen's. <laughs> traditional, traditional, I like that. Um, <laughs> classic, a, a classic uh, a threaded fourth system. Um, I think, again, partly I actually, I like the classic threaded fourth model. I like the, particularly indirect threaded, I like the, the kind of, it has, a, it has a kind of certain elegance to it that it does. It has a warm charm. <laughs> um, but I'm, it, I, it, it, I am aware that this is easier to do using, using call return. Uh, and again, that relates to the question about why I chose 32-bit x86. It's like, it's, I'm less likely to shoot myself in the foot with my assumptions if I go from a threaded fourth to uh, a call return a native code fourth than I am if I start there and then realize, oh, right. Um, so uh, the question was about um, the, the little rabbit hole I went down on whether stack manipulation primitives can be Turing complete. And, um, and the question was, um, does adding extra stacks make that easier? And um, my answer is, I, I simply don't know right now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if depth of, yeah, I, I I don't know, and I mean that's that, that that I suspect is a very deep rabbit hole. But there's there's probably lots of things involving if you can have an arbitrary number of stacks, uh, each with an arbitrary number of of like values on, then you can presumably treat that as a system of integers, that, where each stack rep represents an integer, which you can then add. And yeah, anyway, that's. That's a whole other. Um, that's a whole other rabbit hole. We can have a conversation about that later. <laughs> Is there any plan to implement fail in fail? Um, no, but if. Uh, fail is implemented in fourth, and what you get out of fail is a fourth interpreter. Then, you know, the fourth interpreter you can use. You, you can use the fourth interpreter to read the fail source code in uh, in fourth. So, I don't have any. It would be an interesting exercise to try and implement fail in fail, but currently, currently, it, it's too much string manipulation. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, am I familiar with um, Ule's, uh, Ule and Andrew's uh, seed fourth? And the answer is yes, actually. I, 
Um, I think on some level, the, uh, the, the seed for this idea may have come from uh, pre-fourth and seed-fourth. Uh, I mean, I'm, you're not credited in my talk, but I, I'm, literally, I'm literally using your... Uh, you have a very neat translation from, um, uh, from punctuation to alphanumeric characters uh, in pre-fourth. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I stole that wholesale, and I'm using that. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, yes, yes. So you'll see, you'll see. In I, I've glossed over that uh, in my in my output examples. I'm presenting them as blocks. That's actually what happens because I have an ORC script that converts what that converts this into machine code. Um, but that awk script includes your algorithm for, for converting that slash into a into an uppercase letter. So, so yes, I'm. Uh, I think probably pre fourth pre pre fourth and seed fourth a couple of years ago were what planted this idea in my head that it would be doable. Yeah. So I think that. I th yeah, 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 very much so. And also, I think we both have an interest in seeing how to pull fourth apart into separate components as well, which is, um, uh, yeah. 